welcome to Puzzling Company, your home for at-home puzzles and mysteries. Here are your hosts, Jared and Zach. Well, welcome back to Puzzling Company, your home for at-home puzzle mysteries. It's me, Zach, here in the Deadbolt Mystery Society studio. Also with me, surprise, is... It's Jared. Who are you? I, I'm wondering anymore. We've, we haven't put an episode out in a while. In a hot minute, yeah. We're like, it's just been a weird existence. Well, technically, we put an episode not super long ago. That's true. But, but like, we, we're, we've we're been so very used busy. to the week. Yeah, we've, so much is happening at the escape rooms in real life. Zach's trying to move. I'm trying to move. I'm just like flabbergasted at everything that has happened. Yeah, but I think it's all going to be good things. It's just going to be yeah, change for now. It just changed. So it's good that like now is the time to sit down and talk about games that we've played. Exactly. And you could say that, Jared, you know, we might move different places, but you can say here at Puzzling Company, we were here forever. <laughs> Was that a great transition? What a transition. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, yes, as you could tell, uh, we are going to get to cover the video game that is We Were Here Forever, which just recently came out um, from Total Mayhem Games, yes. if I remember correctly. Um, we've played their other games, really liked them. We were super excited for the new We Were Here Forever. It's one of the games that we played like when we were getting excited about creating this podcast in the first place. Yep. We were sitting around, we're like, it's games like these that get us excited where you can clearly see that people are trying to go above and beyond to create a really cool game. Mm -hmm. So to cover the most recent one, I'm hyped. Yeah. We're going to play it anyway. So I'm very excited to get to cover <laughs> yeah. it too. So, but uh, stick with us. We are going to be back and we'll be talking about, we were here forever. Hey, I just got back from the mail. Looks like we've got a new game to play. Oh, really? What is it? It's the new Escape the Crate game. Oh, I've been excited about this one. I'm personally a little confused. Okay. The title on the box just says Hood Unit. Okay, can you spell that? W-H-O-D-U-N-I-T. Oh, it's Who Done It, Jared. Yeah, in the new Escape the Crate game, it's the Escape Who Done It. It's like a classic murder mystery, but with a twist ending. I mean, agree to disagree on pronunciation, and by the way, it's twist, not twist. Okay. But what you can do is go over to escape the crate.com and use code Puzzling Co, Puzzling C O, all one word, and you'll get 25% off your first subscription order or any single retired box that they have. Well, welcome back to Puzzling Company. We are now here in the first section of the show that is kind of where me and Jared get to talk about, we get to get to review the game. We get to talk about things that we liked about the, ex the experience or the game that we got to play. We have a, a section that's kind of room for improvements, things that we thought could be changed up a little bit, not to like dog on the game, but more just our opinion as well as, you know, we want games to be better. So we just try to give our feedback out there. It's really fun. I am very excited to get to talk about We Were Here Forever. Absolutely. You mind if I give our listeners a little preview about what it's all about? Go for it. So We Were Here is, it's a split team game put out by Total Mayhem Games, as we mentioned. It's all, only two people. I wouldn't recommend playing this game with more than two people. It is uh, on Steam. We played it on Steam. And it is the traditional escape room puzzling that you are used to. I would say fused with high levels of communication based puzzles. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes in, in this game and in most of the other games, you cannot see or you are not near the other character. So it's not like a two player escape game where you're seeing the same things. Most of the puzzles are based around like, what in the world are you talking about? Yes, they are purposely made so that you don't know what the other person so has and have to try to. Right. So like many of the other split screens, but more so this game than anything, because you do have that element of the virtual space, the yep. virtual environment. So it really does take it up a notch. We've covered other split team games. We've covered tabletop ones. We've covered digital ones. This one, in my opinion, takes the cake because of everything that you do get to explore. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but you have your own screen. They have your own screen. The game also involves a walkie talkie. Yes. Type system. And that's supposed to be your primary means of communicating. We always just hop on discord Yep, and choose not to go through that, which I really don't think is that big of a deal. Yeah. It's not a huge deal. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't actually do this, but I imagine that I could just be like, 
hey Jared, <laughs> we could just <laughs> RP the whole. <laughs> yeah, RP. Our, we didn't do that, but it would have been. It could have been fun. It could have been fun. But it, it, it's really great, and I want to make clear we're only going to cover forever the latest the game four game four of the, of the series but we will be referencing the other games because i think it adds layer of context for those yeah and the narrative and everything that is involved with the series do connect as well as different like things that are introduced or characters or puzzle types so we will definitely be referencing the other games but we are covering we were here forever absolutely zach kick us off what do we love about this game yeah i think the first thing that we really enjoyed was the puzzling Still very fresh for a game that has been on its fourth one now. But every time that we did a new puzzle, it felt like something new. It didn't feel like I was doing the same puzzle I did in the other previous games. It was really unique and authentic to be like, oh, well, we get locked inside this box. And now we're transporting this other version of the box. We're all tiny people. And now we have to do this crazy puzzle that requires us to look at two different sides of a jet, like a jester box. Yes. You know, or a puzzle that kind of requires us to be able to access and go through different pathways while being in different parts of a cube is how I'll put it. It like it was unique in terms of every pu- like we ran into puzzle types that are kind of familiar that we've played in uh, in some of their other experiences or other games, but they just have a whole new spin on it. Yeah, I felt like they took risks that they didn't in the other ones. You still felt like that very familiar vein of like this is a we were here puzzle. Yeah, right. Like it's the I'm looking at a shape and. Well, describe to me, like that was there, but then they amped it in many different arenas. They added things that they had in other games. And it's impressive because when I think split experience, I think you're limited to the type of puzzle that you can do. Yep. But they seem to defy that, that mentality. Like, I agree with you. It felt fresh. It just kept being good. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, it was very different. I felt like, like you said, there are those types of puzzles. It's like. Like you said, it's like, oh, well, I have a book that says this. And I go, okay, cool. I have three items I can interact with that are very similar. So you discuss it and you're able to solve it. But then there were some where we had to be like next to each other and achieve puzzles by doing things in a very timely manner and talking while doing it. We had some where we had a timer that's against us and we had to figure out how to achieve five different outputs and and solutions within the time period, Yes, which is pretty hard but how that act like you have to do it and fail and realize like what you can do in that time period for how long it was really cool and i like i said i really enjoyed it like there was puzzles in a very specific part of the game that i'm i know we will potentially talk about that i really enjoyed that i felt unique was a conversation you have with a another character as i'll put it (laughs) and i was like and it was a really unique puzzle because i was like okay you know we have puzzles that are like mostly visual and then sometimes it's sound but they they did a sound puzzle that i thought was really cool because it gave it like part of it like a transcribing puzzle but then the other person had a like a visual and an audio puzzle they had to solve at the same time to work together yes. to achieve the goal it was yes. really well done i totally agree with you and and to take us into the second point the world design the environment design stepped up a level in this we're going to talk about the little bit about the narrative in a while but it felt like finally that the game got bigger, more exploratory. Yes. Because it feels like in other games, you're very heavily funneled, right? And in this game, just the views of the environment that we were in got big. And then the agency of, we finally got options on which puzzles to tackle, Zach. Yep. Never before have we had options before. Yep. And you got multiple pathways that it, they did have to be accomplished. Yes, but, they all, you needed to complete all three of them to achieve the main goal. But, but the order was up to you. Correct, you can do them in any order. And, and what I liked about that is there was one big thing in particular, and I want to see if you agree with this. Okay. Every other game is built around this castle motif, and that is the world that you're exploring. And then in this game, we got out of that. Well, that's what I was going to bring up, is that it's interesting because the first two games, you are basically stuck in the castle that the narrative is based around. Yes. I, I, don't, I don't remember if the, it's called Castle Rockberry because there's there's a town. Like, there's a lot of narrative that gets explained about Rockberry, the town. But I'm pretty positive it's called Castle Rockberry as well. But the castle is where you're mainly at and you're tunneled through through the first two games. And you, you only leave it or try to, as I'm going to put it, at the end of the game. Yes. In the third one, you actually start outside the castle. And then you go your way in again. Yes. Which was a good change. Which is a good change because you actually had something that wasn't just the castle. And then this game goes, hey, what if you played all outside the castle mostly? And I was like, deal. With some other worlds inside the castle that happened on a micro scale like you brought up that were fantastic. Yep. 
it was really well done. I really enjoyed the world building because it felt like we actually got to see the entire town and wasn't stuck in a castle the entire time, which the castle's really cool and well done. Like in all the games that we played, like you get more expansion of the castle and get to do more. It's not like you're stuck in the same three right, areas of the castle right. over and over. You're not just dungeon, dungeon, dungeon. Yeah, you're yes. clearly like in the like higher up in the castle, and some of them you're in the lower part. Some of them you're in like a, a ritual area. Some of them you're in a, like a th- in a jail cell, a theater, a theater. Yeah, that's a fun place. But it, I really liked it because I really enjoyed getting to explore the other zones as I'm going to call them, which were, there are three pathways you get to take at a point in the game, um, which we won't spoil why you have to take the pathways, but we'll explain what they were because they yeah, are just very briefly, important. Very, very briefly, um, yeah. There is Rockberry Town, I think, or Cavern. I, I forget what they technically named it. It's a path that's to the far left. Um, it's kind of a part of the town where they've been doing some different mining operations, it seems, as well as some other things. Um, you're able to travel through it through a ski lift, that takes you all the way to that part. Um, it's like a nice two minute ski lift adventure. We'll be talking more about this. Yeah. Ski lift. <laughs> but you, you take that to this part of the town. So it's like a far distance, but you're still in the town and you're like in this off skirts of it, working on these different puzzles and stuff that are there. And this big vault, I'm going to, uh, well, a big like building that you have to get into with the vault slash the graveyard. You have both players basically go to this really weird entrance of like the skull, like fence area and you both get put into two different areas where one person goes underground into these catacombs and underneath the graveyard and the other person's on top of it and there's a big vault door and you have to work together from above ground and below ground to work together to get into the vault and then there's by far i think jared and i's favorite expansion or area of the map which is the nautilus in which you as the name implies get to take a nice cool downward trip trip (laughs) down into underground areas into a mine, which then you get to see this gigantic ship that goes underground even more. And it has a really cool mechanic where someone is basically in this tunnel system underneath the ground, um, in, in the water, like helping someone who's in a diving suit, essentially walk around and go through these mazes it's just so cool and help give them air and stuff. But then it goes even deeper. Uh, you get to meet a friend as I'm going to put it. And then you get to go even deeper into like this under <laughs> like underwater facility, which was my favorite. I think it's by far the most popular. I, I had to, if I had to guess between us, it was definitely the most popular, but yes. I think between most people, I think they would probably say that the Nautilus is the coolest area. And it was just nice. Like that type of different environment just isn't present in the first three games. And it gives the world so much personality worked well with the narrative. And I just loved it. I think we were both really excited when we reached the point where we were like, wait, are two of these areas going to be blocked off and we have to do the third? And it was like, Nope, we can do any. No, we can do any of like, yes, it does require you. I will, we will say you do have to finish one before you do another. Yes, that is correct. So if you pick one, you are tied to that one, unless there's like a, uh, something we don't know where you can go back like and a look. save point or something. But it, yeah. Once we started the puzzle, we could not go to another one until you completed the puzzle, which is by a, getting something at the end of it yes um to take back which the other part which you didn't tell about in the world bidding is that there's a cathedral so essentially the game starts off in the castle for a very minor bit of the game you leave it you go to this cathedral which is where a lot of the narrative happens to explain kind of what's going to happen in this game and what you're trying to achieve and some more background and then from that point on you're gathering parts for something that you must do in the cathedral. So then that's when you go and explore all the other areas. And we've kind of spilled into this, but that's really our third point is the narrative advancements of this game compared to its predecessors. I feel like the total mayhem games just really hit like a strong point in telling us their story. Yep. Is the story overall my absolute favorite, like based compared to other video games? No, it's still a pretty good story. It's gotten a lot better. I mean, I remember playing the original games and I was like, I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, like, like, what is narrative. the story? Well, I was like, okay, I get that there's the king and like this background with the jester and all this stuff. But I was like, I don't know if it's supposed to be connected or like really what's happening. I know we keep coming back here in the other games. But then the third one explores them more. And I was like, okay, I kind of get actually what's going on now. And then the new one went, well, let's make the narrative involved in 99% of the game. And I went, absolutely. I, I'm totally with it. Zach, you had one thing that happened technically outside of the game in terms of the narrative that you really liked. Do you want to touch base on that? Yes. So they did a like tales of Rockberry, I think is what it's called. I might be wrong. So I apologize in advance, but there was a, a YouTube series that they did. I think they pre-released it before the actual game came out in a series that gave backstory of castle Rockberry, the King 
the jester and characters you've met in the other games, but specifically leading up to the game you're playing. And it's told through like a journalistic point of view of this narrator reading like someone's recollections or what they wrote down about the events of what happened back then and then leading up to what happens. And it's really well done. The music is really solid. The good it, voice. A really good voice. <laughs> I thought it was really well done because it's something that I feel like the game was needing to kind of get people more into the narrative because it seems that they were trying to go more in that direction in the third game after what you learn in the third game. And this game just goes, okay, well, we're going to give you like a seven video series or how many it ended up being. It was a lot of it. It was more videos than I was expecting going like, we're going to give you the whole backstory of everything you've learned basically up to this point. So that when you go into this game, you understand it more. I really, really liked it. And then another thing they added that I thought was really cool compared to other games is they actually added an in-game hint system. I wasn't ready for that. I thought you were kidding when we started playing and you were like, oh, there's hints. And I was like, yeah, funny no, exactly. There are, <laughs> there's a three tiered hint system in the actual game now, which I'm going to give my opinion. It's really cool. They added a hint system. It unfortunately doesn't give the most details because oh, if you've played the We Were Here series, most of the puzzles are quite difficult in terms of communication based puzzles because they're multi, uh, they're, they're so multi stepped. Yes. So there are probably some we didn't look at every hint. We only I actually looked at it once just to see what, what it, was it could like, do. And yeah. then we did one for another later part, but it was exactly what we knew. No solutions. Yeah, there's no it basically helps give you like a connection point and goes like, oh, that's really weird that there's this. And you're like okay, I already knew that's <laughs> the, the one I like when I'm in a jester box and there's these colored window, like colored doors. I think I have a figure. I oh yeah. Out. Cause that's, we did get stuck pretty hard at one point. Yes. And I was like, perfect. Great opportunity to use the hint system. We burnt through all three hints and we were like, that mean anything to you? And we were like, nothing that we didn't know. So it was cool to see them experiment with it, but it doesn't meet our criteria for what the best type I think of hint system is. Oh, agreed. I think it's hard though, because I don't think that with how the game functions, I think it'd be really weird to be like, and how a lot of the puzzles work, you can't really give a solution unless you just tell them the number, like the answer. Cause half of them aren't just numbers. They're right. Like, they're, imagine they're like, you move shape a three quarters. Just imagine if they gave you a solution to try to do the underwater facility at the end of Nautilus. <sighs> Imagine, like, literally, I just imagine the game freezes. They pull up a <laughs> web page on your game, and it goes, here's a 10-step tutorial on how you would complete the potion-making sequence. But it is interesting because that's how we used to have to do it if we got stuck. It was watch somebody else's playthrough say, guide or video. There's walkthroughs and stuff yeah. that people have made through the game. So I know we had that available if we needed to, to, like, be like, okay, we're, like, stuck. I have no idea, so let's go watch someone. But it, it is cool that they added an element so that you can potentially get help inside the game and not look out. But it's not crazy detailed in terms of helping you pass like the main connection point. Let's uh, let's transition because that felt a little bit room for improving, <laughs> even though it was meant to say like the narrative is dope. It's definitely the best. Well, the narrative series. stuff's dope. The, the hint was like an add on. Was, yeah, there you go. But my where I want to start with room for improvements. And I think in our discussions that we were having, this is the part that like I harped on the most is I loved the fact that there was agency in the game. Finally, like it, I wasn't forced to take the route that was supposed to, which is not a bad thing, but I'm always going to err on the side of options. Sure. Right. The options that were presented to us in terms of those three zones that we could visit, in my opinion, felt very disjointed, except for Nautilus. The Nautilus zone was fire. It was so good. I loved it so much. And I think it was hard because again, this is an expectation conversation. We played that one first and we were on cloud nine and then we got to the other two and they weren't bad, but they weren't the Nautilus. Yeah. In my opinion, it went like Nautilus is my favorite zone. And then I thought the graveyard says vault did something really interesting. And then Rockberry caverns or whatever it was supposed to be called. I forget. I had a really cool puzzle in it and probably one of the most difficult puzzles in the game, but like it basically had like two or three puzzles in it. And it was, that was like a majority was just doing the, the hard puzzles. Yes. One zone felt so much more memorable and enjoyable. And there was so much more co I feel like so many content content. In it. Yeah, I agree. That, that's a really great way of putting it. And the other zones had their moments, Yeah, but that's hard when you give agency and it felt like there was a clear front runner. Cause then I would have preferred to like save the Nautilus. Yeah. If we knew the Nautilus was going to be the, the cooler one. So if you're out there listening, Zach and I differ. I say town, vault, Nautilus, work your way left to right. I think Zach is. No, I think you should do that way. Cause I, that, think, that's, that, I think that's weakest of greatest in my opinion. Yes. I, say weakest I think that's the most enjoyable pathway. to. I take. think it would be. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that's hard. I would want to see, it's hard for me to say like, I want to see every zone like the Nautilus zone, but 
I at least feel like they deserve equal shares of moments. Every single zone of Nautilus had a moment. And, and I think part of that, you could hearken back to the episode where we talked about characters. Yeah. There was a character moment there. Yeah. And that was, I, I will never forget that part of the game. I remember us discussing because they well, built up to it. Correct. They, they, yes, I don't want to spoil it, but yes, you, we did have an idea and we discussed and I said, I hope, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 sorry, I don't want to spoil it, but it was like, it's I so hope good. that doesn't happen. And then it happened. And I was like, this is so cool, but I hate this. <laughs> I loved it. It was just all set up so well, but that's what we're saying. None of them have bad puzzles in them. I don't think we nope. were able to get through all of those puzzles. Some of them are a little harder, a little more process oriented. Yep but it was hard that one was like this shine felt like this shining achievement and the other ones just felt so, so yeah. in comparison. I get that. Zach, this next one is funny to me, but it did bother me a little bit. Tell me a little bit about it. Sure. I'll tell you what you found funny. Uh, <laughs> you it, found it funny too. Yeah, I did find it funny specifically with one of them. So, when you go to the three different zones in this game, there is a transition. Even before that. Correct. There are transitions in a lot of the game, actually. When you go between the castle and the cathedral, there's a, a transition walking period. When you go between the cathedral to the main hub before you split off, there is a period of travel or a transition. And then there's a transition in every three zones there and back. The transitions in this game went everywhere in my opinion from really cool to unneeded at all and weird and weirdly long so as an example we're gonna spoil this there's the ski lift transition from the main hub to the i say main hub but like the main area before you go to the three zones to the town to the yeah to the rockberry town and you take a ski lift it literally goes on i think for like two minutes and it nothing happens no characters talk to us or like you can't interact yeah, you're just sitting on a cart, like going through this, like over these, like, don't get me wrong. It does look cool to be over these, like kind of dark and like different mountains and stuff. And it looks eerie a little bit because there's like green lighting and stuff, but nothing actually happens. You're just on a ski. Like I was thinking they're going to scare us or like, or Give like us something. Or the jester is going to show up or like the king character, which I don't want to spoil what he's doing, but like what he does in the game. I thought they were going to do something in that two minutes. I actually didn't tell Jared this, but I actively looked away because I thought they were going to jump scare us in the scenario. <laughs> and it basically nothing happened. I sat there for two minutes on a cart and I went cool. And you're doing this in multiple different transition periods. And it just, to me, it's like if you've ever seen the Indiana Jones movie and they do that transition where you see like the plane, that's what I wish happened. Like, and, oh, but wait, instead, we deal with yeah, that. but instead like they put you into this like really long walking simulator or really long, ride simulators on some and some of them are better than others like the, oh, the, the mine, mine cart the mine cart was cool okay the minecart nautilus nautilus just blew it out of the park it was but, so fun doing like a roller coaster yeah but it was just like on some of them it was just it was just awkward like it was dead awkward time and even in the uh the lift one they cut yeah they, they do like a cut scene and take you farther down the lift but then you're still riding the lift yeah. for like another minute and a half and it was like why didn't we just cut to yeah I don't know. It was a really interesting I, choice. I can't believe you, Jared. You're telling me that when we spun this wheel twice and it transitions between another door that you didn't think that was the coolest transition ever and needed. It just felt so out of place because I'm used to in these games, everything that you can move around. There's very little uninteractable sections. Yeah. And maybe I think you could make an argue that you were you were building the environment and how big this world oh, is. The world is gigantic. Yeah. Really, really so I, I think you can make an argument to say like, that's why you did it. But it was just one of those like weird, awkward, quiet, like look at your friend and like, so like that, the, that's the, the moment. Outside of, today. Yeah. Like we just got out of a really intense cut scene and, so like it, it just it just was it was it was out of place yeah we did we just dealt with the jester and did this crazy nautilus area let's sit on a ski lift for two minutes silent maybe it Woo! was like maybe it was like forced reflection time it might be it might be like what have i done but like just so we could really think about our actions but yeah that just felt out of place and the last thing is just something i've noticed in this game and across the series is if you are a big video game player you care about the interface between your character and the world mm -hmm. and how smooth that is. And I think oftentimes the world looks great. It's very unique, but it still feels every single game. I've noticed this and it rang true in this game. It's still a little buggy. 
it's still a little choppy here and there. Yeah. And it's hard because I feel like is a kind of a minor counterpoint. Part of it, I think is just our, was our setups. Well, I know you played on your laptop one time and you're having, but I think you knew that was most of the, yeah, laptop that was totally the laptop. But like, yeah. I think the point you would agree with the most and where I felt it is that there's a lot of puzzles in all four of the games where you have to click on your mouse to hold on to insert like branch, I say branch, but like stick to turn yes. a wheel or whatever. Yes. And it like is a little buggy in terms of that you would click on it and you don't actually like you need to hold it, but then sometimes you don't, but then sometimes you try clicking on it from like the angle you're it at and, resets you, and, and it resets it and you don't actually click on it or you don't hold it long enough. So it resets entirely. Like it felt really like off at times and I'm like, I'm pressing the button and I'm in the angle that I should be pushing this wheel, this direction and it's not doing it. Yeah. Or like I start doing it and then I don't actually move at all or it just felt off at times. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great way to put it. It's like that mechanic could have been made more user friendly. And I agree. Sometimes it still is just like a little like it felt a little chop buggy, but th that's not the anywhere near the majority of the experience. No, it's just like if if you do have this like a use of playing other games, like it can come off a little vexing, mm -hmm. but it's not. That's why this is at the bottom of our list, because I don't think it's a very big deal. No. But overall, this is. I loved this game so much. Like yep. we played the other ones pretty close back to back to back. Yes. And then I enjoyed waiting and I fully think they delivered on this game. Yep. It is really, really cool. It has some puzzling moments that are some of my favorite video game, board game, tabletop, digital experience. Like there's some really cool. There are some them. really cool moments. This game is not super expensive either. I think it when it was out, it may still be around 15, 16 bucks, but I think it usually retails somewhere around like 20 to 25. And you get a good amount of time in this game. This game went longer than I thought it was going to go. I think as most well. of our games, we end up being in like the, I don't remember how long it was. 10 ish hours near the end. I think the one we played this time was like, yeah, uh, I don't remember though, because I think yours was like extended longer. It, it I think, was. I think I left the game. I think, I think it ended up being eight hours for me. But that's, but that's even another good like that you could talk about is. There are achievements for both sides. Yes, you can play this game multiple times. So you can run through it on both sides, get all of your achievements. And that's fun because I like that a lot too because Zach and I have done that in the past. And it was like, oh, this is what you were experiencing. Oh, it is pretty funny being like, <laughs> yeah, so this is what you had and you struggled with it? Wow. <laughs> yeah. nice. There's a lot of crap talking when you're like, some of it's internal. It's like, really? Like Zach couldn't figure this out. But then you have to remember like, oh, you uh -huh. have the context of the other side yeah, on the second right, run. Let's talk right. about, about me again, Jared. Next time you get stuck in a puzzle, I'm not helping you out of it. I just hearken back to the chess puzzle in the uh, second game. Oh, and, and that was such a, I still blame you. Okay. You know what? <laughs> I still welcome blame to you. puzzling company. It's Jared. And then Zach's leaving. Okay. I'm gone. I can't be a company by myself. You can be puzzling. I can be puzzling. Yep. Puzzling guy. That doesn't puzzling have a guy. great ring. Welcome to puzzling guy. <laughs> no, please don't do that. Welcome to Puzzling Company. <laughs> That's going to wrap us up here in our first section. We have Puzzles to the People coming at you next. Man, I'm just really enjoying Deadbolt Mystery Society games lately. They're just giving me a real sense of nostalgia. Yeah, I've been really enjoying them. My favorite part about them is they just feel balanced. You get a little bit of an escape room, a little bit of a murder mystery. It kind of reminds me of those cartoon TV shows I grew up on. Same. There's one I'm specifically thinking of. It kind of involves a dog and some humans in it. Oh, the Jetsons. I love that show. Okay, close but wrong. No, they kind of like solve mysteries together. Oh, Courage the Cowardly Dog. Okay, they don't solve mysteries. Courage literally does random things. Jared, I was specifically trying to tell you it's Scooby-Doo. Mm, that doesn't sound right. No, 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 Blue's Clues. Okay, they are solving puzzles and mysteries, but no, 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 no. I'm talking about Scooby-Doo. Well, at least the good thing for our listeners is if you like adult Scooby-Doo, you can play a Deadbolt Mystery Society game. And when you want to go purchase one, you can put in the promo code PC 15 for 15% 15 off subscriptions and single one-time boxes. No, I've got it. It's Air Bud. Jared, that's a real-life dog. That's not even animated, and he doesn't even solve crimes. Welcome back to Puzzling Company. We are here in the middle section of our show, which we call Puzzles to the People. And today we're talking about a really big topic. However, I can't forget to mention Deadbolt. It would be a shame if I mentioned that we are here in the Deadbolt Mystery Society studio. But 
even Deadbolt and all of its great gaming can appreciate this conversation because it's something that transcends just puzzle games. But we have to talk about it in the context of what we've played today. And that is, how do you judge? I'm thinking narratively, but it can be puzzle related. How do you judge and rank series of games that come from the same narrative? So think about, we've had this conversation, Zach. We said like, okay, we've played four games. Yep. They're all the same universe world. How would you rank these? But I want to take that conversation bigger to how we also think about, you know, the classics. How do you rank the Star Wars? How do you rank the Harry Potters? How do you rank? Interesting. Like, what is your criteria? Do you think about them individually? Is it the parts or the sum for the whole? And that determines your entire experience with the entire storyline. But let's start back. And I want to start with small and work big. What is your ranking for all of the games that we've played in this series and why? The We Were Here series? Yes. Let's go low to high. What was your least favorite? I would say my lowest ranking one would be We Were Here 2, the second game in the series. Third place would be We Were Here, the original. We Were Here Together would be second place, which is the third game in the series. And then I think my favorite is definitely We Were Here Forever, which is the newest game, which is the fourth in the series. I'm in the exact same situation as you. What leads you to put them in that order? I think specifically what has changed is that as the games have gone on, they've gotten progressively better at doing newer and more creative puzzles and having cooler environments and more and including more narrative bits or small world building items and it, it and voice acting stuff like that that I kept like the world kept expanding and there being more to do as well as game time I feel like as, as the games have gone there's been more to do and play with uh, and more environment space the only reason that honestly it didn't go in order of like the oldest to the newest is specifically and we were here too I felt like there was some things they attempted to do in the second game that just didn't hit yes. super well with me, like in terms of some certain puzzle types or some narrative decisions or there were some really cool elements in it. Don't get me wrong. I liked all of them, but if I had to pick one, I think we were here too is the one I liked the least. Um, just because I think we were here as a, the first game was just like a good, like classic starter, starter yes. one. Like it had its problems, but it worked really well. And then it's just grown well since. Agreed. And then why I think three and four are like second place and first place, obviously is that we were here together, did a really big jump in adding more world building and included a lot more narrative specifically in the later half of the game and more cutscene stuff and more interact. Like it had some really cool elements that made it jump and beat the other predecessors. And then this game, we were here forever said, I'm going to say the meme. There's like the meme of hold my beer. And it's like, then they, <laughs> they do it even better. So it's, they just go off and go, okay, well, everything you liked about the third game, what if we did more of it and added more world building? And you go, yes, I'll take that. I like that because I didn't know, I didn't do a whole lot of research when we played the first game, like how far this series is going to go. How yep. does it work? The other interesting thing about this that I think is going to be different in our conversations compared to the other one is this is an original story. Yep. This isn't an adaptation from something else or um, something that somebody already had some preconceived notions about. But it is super interesting that I feel like we all have these um, intrinsic built standards in our head from playing one game to the next. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between one and two. After we played one, I think the hope is always that games two, three, and four will continue and get better or be different, right? Yeah. In my opinion, I have the same ranking system of you is because I felt like two, we were here too, the second game, didn't offer a whole lot and didn't feel much cleaner. My expectations were set like, you've got to take a step in at least one area, one dimension better, and it didn't. Hmm. Is that fair? Is that how you think and judge games when they come out? Because we were, I remember when we played the third, we were like, yo, that was so much better than two. Yeah. So uh, talk to me about that because we're, I, I think it's interesting, the intricacies of how we judge games. Yeah. I think you just expect, like when you get a certain product and you know, they're going to make more, you just want them to build on it. And then 
you do want them to change up things, but you want it to be similar to a degree. Like yes. you want some familiarity in a game that you're like, oh, this is still the same style of game I'm playing or from the same people, but a new twist or adding more depth into the game, like in terms of narrative or world building or puzzle design. And I felt like I kind of agree that the second one, I, I will, I'll make an argument that I think there's some really cool puzzles in the second one sure. that definitely take a jump over the first game. But I just felt like the game, I was hoping that the second one would introduce way more narrative and start doing kind of what the third game did. And then it didn't really provide enough, in my opinion, in the second game. And then basically the argument became like, well, I didn't get much newer world building, not a ton. And then I didn't gain really any crazy new developments other than a few puzzles. So it, it felt like I was like, okay, I basically played the same game with a little bit of a different environment in the same castle a different ending, which was nice um, in terms of what could happen and like a, a minor upgrade, but it felt like it could have done way more. And I was expecting more from how I really liked the first game and expecting what could come next. Yes. Cause like I said, I felt like the third one did what I expected the second one too. I almost wish that like, I say that in terms of retrospective, I, I kind of wish that the, f that we were here together was almost, we were here too. Like in terms of how it functioned, like the first game was yes. like not a ton of narrative, but gave a little bit of background and was mostly puzzle based. And then like, if we were, we were here too, was like the third game we were here together and basically it was like mostly puzzle. And then at the halfway point added a lot more narrative. And then the third game be mostly narrative kind of is like with, we were here together and then we were here forever doing what it did. Yes. It would have been really cool if like basically the first game didn't have had a little bit of an introduction to get you enticed in the narrative. The second one, added more narrative, and then the third and fourth focused on narrative and really cool puzzles. I think that's fair. Okay, so here's what I want to do now in our middle section. Pick another adjacent space, and I want to see if this same line of logic that we're talking about applies to that. Um, I would say let's try to make it about a world that is self-created and not like an adaptation, so let's not talk about Lord of the Rings because it was a book series first and then became movies. Star Wars is a good example for me because Star Wars was movies first, books and other media came afterwards. Okay. But pick I mean, I'll do Star Wars. You're going to go Star Wars? Sure. Okay. So we all know episodes four, five, and six come out first, then yep. one, two, and three. And then just recently we've experienced seven, eight, nine with a host of intermediate flicks like Solo, Solo. And, uh, and other ones. So TV shows, stuff like that. Sure, TV yeah. shows. How do you go about ranking and judging those in your mind does the same logic from we were here in that series apply or does media different types of media change the game that's a very interesting question i feel like it does partially apply i do believe that you want more world building or more things to think about as the series goes on like if it was the same movie over and over and over again you wouldn't be excited but if you know like Oh, at the at the end of the first movie, it kind of sets up more introduction of other characters or world building of them to travel and like for Luke to get more training or whatever. And you go like, cool. So in the next movie, you get that, and then you gain more character development and more training and more fights and stuff, and you get more of that satisfaction of like, oh, now you have my first interaction with Vader. And then you know the final one having the solution and the re like gives you the resolution of that series and going like, you got all the character development, you get the the action you wanted, you get interesting developments and narrative and then it ends and you go cool and then the next sets go like okay well we're new prequels so we're going to help give you more world building to explain the characters that you met already yes and potentially ones you didn't know a ton about and you only saw them when they're older so it'd be interesting to see them when they're young and then build on that and then the, the final series goes what if we went in the future 30 years after you knew those characters and you're like okay so i I, I think you do look at them the same because you basically want them to go, does this give more world building? Does it feel familiar that it, it's still somewhat of a star Wars movie? And then does it bring more than its predecessor did in terms of developing the story, the characters, the events? Cause I think that's what most people, I know hot topic people's discussions of rankings of the star Wars movies, specifically <laughs> seven, eight and nine or one, two and three. But the thing is like, you know, people go, I, I know this is an opinion I've heard a lot of is people go, well, seven in the new series is a lot like four from the original in terms of how they're for, because JJ Abrams did it. And it was basically almost the same formula set up care development, so on and so forth. And you go, okay, that felt really familiar. I liked it, 
but it didn't add anything new. You're like, okay, but it's still like a Star Wars movie. I felt like that's a good Star Wars. And then eight is probably one of the most controversial other than nine in terms of Star Wars movies and where people go, well, I think it was Ryan Johnson did eight and eight takes a very different approach to a Star Wars movie. It still has the same Star Wars characters, but how it's presented the narrative in terms of what's presented, the philosophies that they're trying to have you think about and giving you topics that you need to discuss and figure out what how you believe in them and what that truly means is really cool because it's a different twist on the movie, but it wasn't familiar. So people go like, this doesn't feel like a Star Wars movie. Like it feels something mm. different, but it has characters I like. So like some people really like it because they go, that's a really cool way of telling the story. That's very different than other people go like, that's not Star Wars. You know, so p- your people's opinion obviously are different, but you... I feel, I feel like most people want it to feel like it's something they know to a small degree. Like they okay. know it's the same series. Okay. So here's what, let me, let me try to recap what I feel like you're saying. Okay. What you're looking for is uh, the word that's coming to mind is like building. Yes. Doesn't matter if it's character world or maybe expansion. Yeah. Is the right word. Like that is the biggest factor that you are looking at when you're looking at games or media in a narrative series. Hmm. Because if you just give me the same or if you or let's say you just don't build at all, you try to give me something completely different but connected, it doesn't do a whole lot for you. Yeah. That's really interesting. I'm interested to hear what your order is. Would you like to know my order? I'll give you you give your order. I'll give mine. Okay. Are we doing all nine films? All nine films. Oh, I'm taking I'm taking solo. Rogue One. We won't add those in because yeah, it's yeah. too many. I'm talking about just the core episodes, which you may not even, I don't even want to rank some of them. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I would say, wow, this is hard. I think, honestly, nine might be one of my least favorites. Okay, so you're going least to... I'll go least to my favorite. Okay, okay so I'll say nine is probably my least favorite. Nine and then eight, Probably. I think eight has some, I actually really like a lot of elements of eight in terms of it being different, but I, I just don't think it's one of my favorites compared to a lot of the other ones. And then I want to say it's two. Then I want to say it's one. I'm going to say, then it goes seven. Okay. So I've covered all the sequels. Right. Now you have the core. Collection. So I have three, four, five, and six. Yep. Wow. Okay. I'm going to say four is next. Then I'm going to say, Oh, I feel like people are going to judge me for this. <laughs> I'm going to say it goes six, then five. So five is your favorite. Well, there's three still. Oh, three. I think three and five are like my two. Wow, you've got three that high. Here's the thing. I think it depends on when you were born. Oh, I I, I agree. I think this is this is this goes way beyond the context. But like the sum of three is not the greatest, but... The whole end of three is probably one of the most, one of the most nostalgic things I can think of and best and coolest moments in star Wars history has been Anakin and Obi-Wan at the end of episode three Mm -hmm. and the development into Vader. And it is so well done in my opinion. I mean, you could argue there's parts in the beginning of episode three there, but I feel like in, in terms of my age, that's what I grew up with. And I had watched the originals, but like seeing three was one of the coolest things. I mean, most people will tell you one of their favorite scenes in star Wars is the battle uh, between Anakin and Obi-Wan. Okay. So I would say three and five are like, you near each pick, other. You got to pick. I'd say five is better than three, but three. So, is like second. so let's recap from greatest to least. You are five, three, six, four, four seven, seven, one, two, and then eight, eight nine. nine. Yeah. Okay. I I'm with you on a lot of that. Yep. Uh, going least to worst. I'm nine, eight, two. Yep. Three. Wow. Seven. Okay. One. And then it goes, um, one's good. I love dark. And then it goes six, five, four. Four is your favorite. Four is my favorite. Interesting. No, I'm sorry. I've got that backwards. Four, five, six. Okay, so six is your favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You Return of the Jedi. Ewoks, man. Like, let's go. Indoor is the stuff. Okay, it is, okay, six and five are both very good, obviously. It's interesting though, because I feel like Empire Strikes Back, very good. Such a good film. I, I I agree. I and and one I agree with you on the age thing. Like it was all so new. The pod racing was engaging to me. I thought the end of one is just like obviously 
I love Qui Gon Jinn, uh, and I and <sighs> I loved the Darth Maul. But here, section of the movie. but I want to bring it back because here's what I want to ask you: if you think this is true, okay? Because I feel like we were here did something that I'm not used to, okay? Which is you have this new concept, the first one. It comes out, and you're like, like Pirates of the Caribbean, okay? Dope. Yep, love Pirates of Johnny Depp, like. That Orlando Bloom, Karen Knightley, like, and then as it goes on, it's like, or what are we doing here? Sure. Um, and and then it kind of felt like that when they did episode one. It was like you could get excited about it. Maybe you didn't like some things, and then it just two and three, in my opinion, just got worse. And then seven, eight, nine followed the same thing. It's like okay, here we're gonna rebirth it again. Seven, seven is has some potential. It depends on how eight and nine goes, but I feel like it's so hard to produce a sequel trilogy quadrology that gets keeps getting better yeah and wish you were here if you don't count two and you start from one and go to the end it gets better yep is that a difference in gaming versus just media i don't know if they are very i don't know if they have to be entirely different from each other i think it just depends on what you're doing because you can make arguments that seven eight nine's reason was that they had different directors for different movies sure so having jj abrams do the first and the last but not the second one that's what i think most people were frustrated with in my opinion was that like okay well jj abrams basically made four again with seven but i was like it was something really familiar everyone really liked it it was like familiar so you're like cool i get to do this and we're gonna build it again and then eight went Let's try something completely different. I was like, okay, interesting, but it doesn't really fit after seven and it kind of is its own thing. And then you do nine and nine goes, hey, everything that you just learned in episode eight, we're going to retcon in the first 30 minutes of the movie. <laughs> and then the rest of the movie is going to be a speed chase of nostalgia. And you're like, weird, but okay. Because I, I, I hated that nine basically went, let's retcon episode eight. And I'm going to just scream at you that uh, character is back. And you're like, how? <laughs> okay. So I want to, before we jump in, I think it's fun to not, like talk favorites and all of that. So I'm going to name a couple of other series. You're okay. going to give you yours. I'm going to give you mine. And then I want to finish this conversation about looking at some of the other games that we've played that have had storylines, consistent storylines over games. Talk about how we feel about those a little bit. Harry Potter, not the books, just the movies. I have the ring. I don't know if I can. No, no. I just want you to give me your favorite. Oh, my favorite of all. Give me your favorite. Half-Blood Prince. Really? You're a Half-Blood Prince. Well, it's hard. I really like the book. Also, Goblet of Fire. Those are like my two favorites. You got to pick one. You can't. Stop this, Jared. I can have two favorites, okay? (laughs) I would say in terms of movies, it's hard. I don't know which one I like more as a movie. Um, I'm going to say, I'll say Half-Blood Prince. Going Half-Blood Prince. Yeah. I think I'm going Goblet of Fire. They're both good. They're both good. I, I... I just Cedric Diggory and I'm the half and Vol- Voldemort coming back. And it's yeah. just, and, and the, the tri wizard turn, you're getting to meet oh, the, all the, these the things. The tournament's so It's so good. good. It's That's so what's good. hard. I like that movie because the tournament's so cool. And my little brother quit watching the movies on that movie. And I was like, what are you doing? Brendan, if you're listening to this, which you might not be, uh, finish it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go Marvel in oh. terms of Avengers. Wait, the, uh, we're only doing the Avenger movies? Only doing the Avengers movies. So, like, Avengers 1, Age of Ultron, uh, Infinity War, or Civil War, yeah, Infinity yes. War. And, okay. Infinity War. Really? Yeah, I, I think Infinity War is better than Endgame. Those would be my... The original Avengers also is phenomenal. I think Age of Ultron is the weakest. Age of Ultron is my favorite. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Jared. <laughs> it's I, not usually a wrong opinion. You have the wrong opinion. I, I think we've mapped this out before and it's really close, but I think Infinity War does a edge out. Endgame. Endgame. And then I think Avengers is tied with like Endgame. Yes. The original Avengers is so good. Um. Okay, I'm going to take it back a little bit. Okay. Indiana Jones. Oh, and if you say Crystal Skull, Skull, you can just walk out right now. But they have Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> I would say my favorite Indiana Jones is definitely Raiders of the Lost Ark. Really? Is it the opening scene that does it for you? Okay, it's the whole movie. I think I don't like Temple of Dune that much. I l- <sighs> Temple of Dune is probably my second favorite. What's the other one I'm thinking of? It's Temple of Dune, Temple of Doom, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Last Crusade, and then Crystal Skull. I would say my favorite is Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think 
Another one that I can maybe make an argument for is Last Crusade. I think those are both for, both really good. I love Last Crusade. The the ending. What about Crystal Skull? Oh, I was so. That's what. This is what I'm talking about. It's like we can't. Things don't end well. Like, do you, do you want to get into uh, a very famous uh, TV show adaptation of a fantasy book series? Wait, uh, you're talking about Game of Thrones? Yes, I'm talking about Game of Thrones. Uh, yeah, it's true. Game of Thrones was so good until the end. And then I, I it's just it. to me, here's what I wonder. And I wonder and, and then I want to do one more. It, I feel like it's so hard to finish a story that you didn't finish writing mm-hmm. on the onset. So, like, I even wonder if that if maybe that's why we were able to judge the later ones later is because we barely had any narrative when we were talking about the first we were here. It was so vague, right? That now when we got more and more narrative, now we're able to judge it. So I wonder if that's thing. Last thing, this might be the most important one to me because this is like one of my most beloved movie series and it is from a book and I'm going back to Lord of the Rings. Okay. I don't really count the Hobbit series, even though some of it's kind of fun. What the? But I'm, <laughs> but I'm talking about where do you fall on the big three? Oh, jeez. Okay. Just your favorite. Okay. In my opinion, there's Sorry, a very I'm, clear answer okay, here. You're going to you're going to be mad at me cuz I'm going to have to ask you. Okay. Return of the King, Two Towers. Yes. And Fellowship of the Ring? Yes. The name of the three? Okay. Okay, it might actually just be in the order they came out in. I really did It's hard. I think Two Towers and What? What are you what are you doing over there? Yeah. It's two towers. Okay. Period. Two towers. Period. Okay. okay. Return of the King has some awesome moments in Return of the King. You know it. Don't you say anything, Jaren. <laughs> uh, but two towers, I mean, it, it's definitely one of those two. If, Ret- if Helm's Deep, just as a... Oh, uh, yeah. Just Helm's as... Deep like, if the battle for Helm's Deep isn't enough for you, it's nothing true. will ever be enough for you, Zach. Two towers is probably the best of the three. I could agree to that. I just think the end of, obviously, Return of the King is... Where do you come in on Men in Black? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, we don't the newest even, one. We wouldn't go. And the newest one. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out. Let's let's transition now that we've offended all of our listeners by ranking some of our favorite movie series. As you look around some of the other games that we've played in our closet, or even some of the ones that we have up on our wall that have this continuing storyline going. How do you think and how do you judge those? I'll start. Scarlet Envelope has a continuing story. But what's interesting about that is you're slowly getting the larger story. It, it to me, it kind of feels a little bit like um, the mystery incorporated version of Scooby-Doo, where it was like every episode is you find the crook, but there's always this bigger story. I was going to say, I feel on. like this is like a TV show where it's episodic, but there are episodes that are connected. Yeah. But, but so then in your mind, is it even worth talking about, which one was better than the other, or is it purely like the episodes are so different? You're just talking about things I, that you, I think you, can't, you can't agree with. I don't think you can really, I mean, you could compare them. You could find things you like about each of them, but I think they're just very different in terms of narrative. They are connected by the overarching, like secret organization they are in with the Scarlet Envelope. So there is a really cool, like background narrative that connects them all. But I mean, you're comparing apples to oranges almost like if this story is more of a detective, like you're trying to figure out who did it. But then this game is, uh, like more of a modern escape room style puzzle game. Yes. And then one's a puzzle haunty style one. Like they're all very different. It's hard to be like, how am I going to compare an apple to an orange in terms of like a style of game? Okay. Cause that's, I think with them specifically, cause you're, like I said, their games are very different. Like one's like, Oh, well this, like you said, one is uh, the murder at the diner thing. And then one is, you know, you're in space. And then this one, you're in a mansion, like trying to get a fortune from this guy. And the next one, you're in a castle. Yes. They're all very different. Okay, so then I, I think that's fair. Let's end it with this then. Okay. Because maybe we are talking about apples and oranges. And that's okay. That's what we're here to pontificate about. Let's talk about some of the sequels that we know are coming out from some of our games that we love. Okay. What should be the expectation? I'm thinking of, like, I'm looking around. I know that hopefully there's supposed to be a, 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 a sequel to Root of All Evil. Soup, I know there's talk that there might be another one there. What are some of the other ones that people have said? Like I, I'm thinking of some of like the more immersive games. Like there's all, there's always been like, Oh yeah, be looking out for a second. But in, in these kind of, maybe we're just talking tabletop games. How do we think about that? Like what, what are our hopes for those next round of games? 
you just want them to keep building on the things that you enjoyed in the first ones. I, I, th- I think it, it ends up being everything we've said about the adjacent ones. It's like, if I'm playing another soup, I want more of the familiarity that I enjoyed about soup and it's, it's humor, it's style, but I want more world building. I want more characters. I want more things to potentially interact with that are different and unique compared to the first game, but still have that flavor of this is a soup game or root of all evil where there's a clear narrative that gets concluded potentially in the first game. But then if there is another root of all evil, like what happens next, you know, there's some things that are still left open for you to try to figure out, you know, with all those games, like when we played series, like the Maddox lost treasure, you know, or yes, the posy ring, like some of those that are connected to a degree connected versus continuation. Yes. Yes. You know, you just want more of the things you liked in it. So you want that familiarity, but a new spice and like you said, expansion or, Something that makes it fresh but familiar, I think, is what you always want. Or you, that's what you're looking for because you want a product that, unless it's made that they're all very different, like you make different products that go like, this is this style mm. game. It's its own standalone. It's going to be nothing like this one other than it's a product that we made. Then it feels nice. But if you're on like, I'm making another Root of All Evil, you're looking for the another Root of All Evil. I just thought of 50 Clues would have been a good... yeah. Like, but we've talked through that. If you're, if you're interested to hear our rankings on 50 clues, that would be another, but I agree. It's, we want to take what is familiar with us into a new chapter. Yep. We don't want to lose the good familiarity of what some of our most beloved games hold. We want them to grow. We want them to change, but we don't want them to lose the essence of who we are. And maybe that's why we get upset as we look and rank things. Cause when I think about going best time back to, we were here, I wanted it to grow in the second game and it didn't feel like it or in the star Wars, it just changed so drastically and it didn't maintain its quality mm-hmm. from its other ones. So I think it's really interesting. If you're out there, I would, I would challenge you to rank some of your favorite media series. Uh, I'm sure there's ones that we'd be interested in. and really challenge yourself to think about why you consider them better or worse Um, Because inevitably, we're always all as people giving feedback. And I think we need to be able to verbalize those. And that's why I enjoyed this exercise with you today, Zach, because I'm really trying to ask myself, why do I feel different ways about games that are interconnected in a direct narrative series? Like, Mm -hmm. what really is asked of the next and the future one? That's really going to wrap us up for our middle section. We have questions for creators coming at you next. Hey everyone, Jared here. And if you've listened to the podcast for any amount of time, you know that Zach and I love to test our skills as private investigators. We've done this for local police departments, federal agencies, and we always seem to catch our bad guy. But one of our favorite companies to do that with is Unsolved Case Files. They have a really great product. Their game works through envelopes, Every time you solve part of the case, you open another envelope and you get to dig into even juicier and deeper details until you finally figure out what's going on. They have a great online input system for their answers. And of course, as we always talk about, a great hint system to complement it when you get stuck and you're looking for that extra nudge. Personally, we love these games because they tell great stories. Those stories have great twists and the connections that you are making to solve the case lead to those super satisfying aha moments. Me personally, I like these games because they're what I call one sitting games, which means they take about an hour to two hours and you don't have to worry about a cliffhanger ruining it if you want to get all the way through it. You're getting an entire story, an entire game every time you play unsolved case file games. Currently, there are eight of these games out there. You can find these games at unsolvedcasefiles.com. And just for being one of our listeners, you can get 15% off by using the code PUZZLE15, all one word, PUZZLE15 at unsolvedcasefiles.com. Welcome back to Puzzling Company here in the last section of our show called Questions for Creators. We get to meet the awesome people that make the games that we love, except for today, where we do not have a creator with us today. It has been a crazy time for Total Mayhem Games with the release of this game. We've been in contact with them. We've missed each other a couple of times. We're hoping to get this interview up because they're really good game creators. Mm -hmm. If you've listened to the rest of this episode, you know that Zach and I really enjoy their content. But Zach, sometimes you just can't get it done on a deadline. True. And very similar to last year when the creators of Key Enigma for Hack Forward weren't able to get together. And that's okay. 
if we can get the interview, we're going to put it up there. Mm -hmm. Um, But definitely still check these games out. Think about being one of our Patreon members because our Patreon members are going to get a copy of one of these games. And this is just, I just really enjoy it. I'm, I'm very uh, interested. One of the questions that we'll hope to ask is, is there going to be another one? Do you think there'll be another one, Zach? Do I? It's, it's hard. I feel like it could end on the point it's at. However, it does kind of open new possibilities. And with every game, there's always, it feels like there's a new possibility. So I'm excited. I, I really hope there's another one because I really enjoy the series. But I could see this being the end of that storyline from what yes. we saw. And it would be interesting too because this company as a collective has only put out this series. Yes. So it will be very interesting to see what else they're capable of in the future, mm-hmm. which I'll be there. Oh uh, yeah. I'll we'll be, I'll be there to check that out for sure. Um, Zach, how can people help us out in our endeavors moving forward? Yeah. Uh, there's many different things you can do to support us. The first thing you need is support us on Patreon. You can become a patron and be able to get episodes early. You'd be able to get rewards and stuff like that. You'd be able to join our discord, be able to talk to Jared and I be able to play some games with us. It's a really fun time. We appreciate all of our patrons. You can also follow us on social media at Puzzling Company on Facebook and Instagram, as well as you can go to wherever you listen to this podcast, that's Google, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever, um, and leave us a five-star review and just let us know what you thought of the episodes slash the series as a whole, and we'd super appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'd say the last thing I'd add to that is now we have a mailing list, an emailing list. Mm -hmm. You can find that on our website and just sign up for that. And it'll push you into a group of people that are going to be receiving some very fun quarterly emails was something that Zach and I are working on that we're going to be a little cryptic about right now. But that really is going to wrap us up for this episode. In the next part of the summer, what Zach and I are working on is something called triple threats. Zach, do you remember what we talked about, what a triple threat is? No. It is a company that has a digital game. Oh, an in-person and... Uh... An escape room and a tabletop game. Yes. So some of these are going to be very familiar. We've got some great returning guests from our first season. All brand new content, though, and we're super excited during the month of July to kind of focus on what we're calling Triple Threat Month. Stay cool out there for Puzzling Company. This is Jared and Zach. See you guys. Thanks for listening. Find us on social media at Puzzling Company and online at puzzlingcompany.com. Check back weekly for new episodes. Until next time, keep puzzling. Shift Cassette Studios. This has been Globe Media Network Podcast.